On this episode of Mom Sipping Sangria... Those two things are going to determine what type of wine you can choose. I'm good. Let's do it. Welcome to Mom Sipping Sangria. I'm Sheila Walsh. And I know we sound like we've been into the sangria, but we haven't, right, Anita? <laughs> no, we haven't. We're just giddy. I'm Anita Reynolds MacArthur, and we're sipping on a, oh my, a taken a piss crisper no, sangria. Not, not, Sheila, not, explain. Not, not, ta- not taken a piss, it's taken the piss. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'm leaving that in let me just <laughs> it is taken the piss crisper okay <laughs> sangria and uh, the reason I chose that Anita where's your head these days is because <laughs> I said we were getting <laughs> we're going to be talking to a uh, wine expert by the name of Natalie McLean who we just love oh my gosh she was amazing and this is from her website because she knows all things wine so I figured we might as well start the um, episode featuring her with one of her sangria recipes and this is called Taken the Piss, Crisper Sangria. And <laughs> Taken the Piss is a, is a British saying, and Crisper refers to the Crisper in your fridge. And that's all I'm going to say. You're going to have to go and uh, look it up because it's pretty cool and it's it's really tasty. All right. Well, I will be checking that out and putting it up on our website for sure. So now you have the Crisper also is intriguing to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So how are things going there in uh, the east end of uh, the Toronto area? Well, Sheila, 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 you know, um, during these COVID days, I have to say the little critters are all around us. They seem to be coming out more and more. We've got a lot of skunks and uh, raccoons. Um, We even have possums. They're like, so the night critters are out. um, So we can't put our dog Walter out um, in the evening, you know, in in our backyard anymore. So we have to take him around the block. So Ava and myself uh, decided to do that the other night, around midnight, and we noticed that our next door neighbor's garage door was wide open, but it was, you know, midnight and the lights were out and it was like, should we close their door? I don't know. So we th- I just texted her and uh, thought she'll just get back to me. We'll go around the block and she'll let me know whether or not they would do it themselves or if they want us to do it. Come around the block and it's still wide open. It's dark. Haven't gotten a response. Uh, so, you know, Abe was like, well, let me just go close it. And I said, okay, but you're going to have to do it really slowly because we don't want to wake them up. So uh, so she's like, okay. And I get Walter and I'm like about two and a half feet away from the garage door and she's closing it. And I'm telling her slower, slower. And she's like, okay, I got it. I got it. And she closes it and we go in the house and that was that. Well, the next morning, my phone dings first thing in the morning and it's Rena, the next door neighbor saying, I wish I had seen this text last night. And she proceeds to send me this video and there was a skunk that had been trapped in their garage all night long because we had closed that door and it had gone to town on their yard waste bags. It had made a lovely bed for itself, which is probably what it had. It had probably fallen asleep because there was absolutely no smell when we went up to it. Thank God it didn't wake up because it would have been a disaster. Oh my we would have had the dog was right there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we had a good laugh over that, but uh, I don't think I'll be closing anyone's garage doors <laughs> from now on. <laughs> Just trying to do a good deed and neighbors have to look at neighbors' things, but now you know there was, uh, there was more yeah. to that story. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I've always wondered? I've always wondered, so maybe that skunk, you know, uh, sensed you and didn't want to spray because they ran out of spray. Like, I know nothing about skunks. Can they spray and then spray again, I wonder? Maybe you just got lucky. I There was like zero smell because Walter usually goes crazy. We always know when one's in the area. Because he, you know, you could, he just senses it and his, his stance changes. Nothing out of him. So we had no idea that this thing was in there. So Crazy. anyways, that was a little lesson learned on our part. Mind you, they told us, you know, next time, sure, go ahead, have out or close that door. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I was at my sister Anne's a little while ago and she was saying, you know, we're going to socially distance and sit outside in the backyard and have a couple of uh, glasses of wine. And um, she said, but, you know, I have a fox 
a little fox that kind of comes out and, and just sits in the backyard and suns himself in the day. And I'm thinking, that's really weird. So when I went over, mm. I was anticipating, are we going to see this fox? But like you, didn't see a fox, but saw something out of the corner of my eye. And this little skunk was just kind of walking through the bushes and then walking back. And he kept on going back and forth. And she's like, oh my gosh, what do we do? I'm like, nothing. Mm. They're, as long as you don't threaten them, they're okay, I think. Right. <laughs> At least we didn't run into a problem. <laughs> oh my God. Well, they're not going to come towards you. So they're not going to come towards you. But yeah, you don't want to be walking towards them. For sure. So as we mentioned off the yeah. top, um, this episode's sangria recipe comes from a woman who just knows her wine and so many other things. We had a chance to speak with Natalie McLean earlier this week. And oh my gosh, she is so knowledgeable and funny. Is she ever? She is named the world's best drinks writer at the World Food Media Awards and has won four James Baird Foundation Journalism Awards. Uh, Natalie McLean's first book, Red, White and Drunk All Over, A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass. It's a great <laughs> and name. And her second book, un- <laughs> isn't it? And her second book, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines were both selected as one of Amazon's best books of the year. Wow. Uh, she also hosts her own podcast called Unreserved Wine Talk, and she teaches wildly popular online wine and food pairing classes at nataliemcclain.com. And she joined us earlier from her home in Ottawa. Hi, Natalie McLean, a.k.a. Chief of Wine Happiness. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to Mom Sipping Sangria. It's so good to be here with you, Sheila and Anita. Natalie, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? It's almost cocktail hour, but not quite. Somewhere, though. Oh, of course. Um, We wanted to get right into it because there's so much to talk about today. Uh, Let's start with what was the path that led to you becoming a wine expert? And I believe sommelier is the right word. Mm-hmm, right on. Um, so wine really wasn't part of my family uh, table growing up. come from Nova Scotia. Um, so it was beer and whiskey on the table, not wine. That was a little too fancy. Um, and I really actually didn't start drinking, as I say, until I met my husband. <laughs> and um, I haven't found a reason to stop. So, But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the knowledge didn't come till much later in life, until we had graduated from um, the MBA program at West in London, Ontario, and we started going out for dinner. And because we didn't, well, I didn't cook and he didn't want to, so we would go out a lot and we'd order wine. I I remember the first time that we went to this little Italian restaurant around the corner from our apartment in Toronto, and the waiter said, well, would you like the Brunello? And we thought, yeah, that sounds like a great pasta dish, but it was it was a full bodied red Italian wine. Oh. And we absolutely loved it. And so that sparked the passion. And then from there, you know, we took a sommelier course at night because we could drink, uh, you know, and being A-type personalities, we weren't going to take up golf and that kind of thing. So it went from there and and, um, it continued. That's fantastic. Now, we noticed uh, on your website, you're holding a glass of red only in those photos. Are we to presume that uh, that red is your go-to? Absolutely. That that glass has long been finished, but it's been refilled (laughs) Many, many times. Um, that's not just a prop. Uh, that glass is a big one. Um, I don't know if you beep out certain words, but it's a big ass glass. <laughs> it really, I've seen bigger, but that is a big ass glass. <laughs> yeah, okay. And that's the one you use for Pinot Noir. So um, my favorite go-to wine, because it's, I think, the wine of hedonists. It's uh, got all the sort of cherry berry flavor you could love, but not the heavy oak and alcohol that will leave you asleep on the sofa at seven. So it's often served in a big glass because it has so many wonderful, beautiful aromas. (laughs) Some of those glasses get so big, I swear you could probably have a facial in one afterwards. (laughs) Hey, there's an idea. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, A lot of people say they can't drink red gives me a a headache what's the response and is that all reds is that like pinot and and cab and all those different ones it depends everybody's body is different in terms of what you might react to so there are i think more compounds natural compounds in red wine that can affect people like the tannins is is one of them tannin is uh, what you get if you eat uh, walnuts or oversteep tea you get that furry mouth feeling right um, so 
those are tannins. It's kind of a drying astringency, and it's often found in red wines, and it comes from the grape skins or the barrels in which the wines are aged. And so, because with white wine, the grape skins are removed. There's no color or very little color. You don't get those tannins, and especially in an unoaked white. So that could be it, or it could be the histamines. There are natural histamines in red wine that aren't as prevalent in white wines as they are in red. Um, but then on the white wine side, you get sulfites. It's not a, as big a problem as you might think. There's a small percentage of the population who are allergic to sulfites, but there's more sulfites in a glass of orange juice than an entire bottle of wine. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so if yeah. people are staying away from that because of the sulfites, then that's not necessarily um, something that they, they have to be super conscious of, but obviously if they react, they, they should uh, take a different direction. Very interesting. Exactly. Okay, so so oh. it is the, the ingredients that would, would affect people differently. Hmm, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, which then, I guess, leads me to the question, so like, why do we choose the wines that we choose? Like, for instance, when we walk into a liquor store and we're not sure what we're going to pick up, then suddenly we, you know, especially for women, um, is there an answer for why we're picking up the bottles that we're picking up? Sure. There's one of comfort. Um, We often default to the same wine over and over again, which um, I can understand, and yet there's a whole world of pleasure and taste waiting for you in wine that I really do encourage people to try different wines, but I can understand it because wine is a purchase that's unlike most other consumer products. Um, You can't try it on like you can with a dress. You can't sort of flip through the first chapter like you could with a book, and you can't try it before you buy it at least not legally. (laughs) So you have to wait till you get home. And so we're often looking at, you know, a cute critter or a castle or a a clever name on the label. And that's how most people make their buying decisions. And so, you know, I think women in particular, uh, we are the major household purchasers still of everything from shreddies to SUVs in the family. And we buy the majority of wine. The studies show we buy 80% of wine because we're also the social planners and the dinner party folks and the, the shoppers. So we often look for wines that will please everyone. Like if we're having a book club or if we're having a dinner party, we're often trying to gauge, okay, which wines are going to kind of be pleasing the palate of many guests. And so that too can be tricky to negotiate. And um, it's why I often say, you know, if you know you like a certain wine, okay, you love this, whatever, this Shiraz from Australia, ask the liquor store staff person, Tell that person, I like this wine. Can you recommend something else that's like it? And they'll already have an idea of your taste preference and your budget. Oh, that's a smart way. So that way you can expand your horizons, but not have that, uh, you know, you're not taking as great a chance. Exactly. And you can do that in restaurants, too, because often the wines on the list are probably, you're not even familiar with them, nor am I, because they try to get wines that are not in the liquor stores to give you a a different taste experience. So do the same there too. Say, I love this particular Malbec. Uh, What would you suggest from your list that would be comparable? Um, What are your thoughts on like a house wine brand? Well, traditionally house wines were kind of the Venus dumping ground of restaurant lists. Um, (laughs) The late Anthony uh, Bourdain said it was like um, legalized mugging. (laughs) (laughs) uh, the, The markups were the most on those wines because they would get something cheap and nasty and then mark it up so much because a lot of people order house white or house red without really thinking about it. They just, and again, I I don't fault anyone for that because, you know, our our brains have been making decisions all day. You don't want to go to a restaurant at night if, if you're not into wine and try to figure out, you know, which one of these are we going to drink? Just give me the house red, <laughs> house red or house white. So, but these days, if uh, there are more and more restaurants that care about their wine lists, and they also care about the buy the glass selections. So, to me, if the restaurant cares about something like buy the glass, it's like they care about the bread they serve. It's kind of that canary in the mind that tells you, okay, this is going to be a good good meal. Mm. So it really does depend on the the type of restaurant you're going to. And that's not to say you have to go to a fancy place to get a decent house wine, but you just want to look carefully. How are they sort of, you know, presenting the list? 
you know, the, the caliber and quality of, of the food and service will also be indicative of what you can expect from the house wine. Right. And like you said, if uh, it, you can always ask them, just like you can ask the LCBO that, you know, I want to try something like this. This is what I like. And then maybe if they're, they know their wines, they're able to offer you that information. Exactly. Exactly. Can I just throw a couple of questions at you regarding um, looking for maybe what's a, a low cow wine or a low sugar wine? Or can you school us a little bit on is there such a thing and maybe recommend what to look for? Sure. Um, there have been brands la- launched um, internationally that are deliberately low-cal, and I haven't come across any that I'm super keen on because usually they're making the wine and spinning it out, um, almost denaturing it of its alcohol. Alcohol is a flavor carrier. Um, it's also a fun carrier, but it, it <laughs> carries the flavor of, of the wine, and so it's a it's a fine balance that you want to strike when you're trying to find something that is um, low alcohol or low calorie. So what I suggest is look for cool climate regions: um, Ontario, BC, Nova Scotia, uh, Germany, um, Austria, all kinds of them. Uh, New Zealand. Cool climate means that there are less or fewer ripening days and sunlight and heat to ripen the grapes. As a result, those grapes have less sugar than, say, a really warm climate in Napa or Sonoma or Australia. Less sugar translates into less alcohol or lower alcohol. Lower alcohol means fewer calories. So if you look for, like, Riesling or Pinot Noir uh, from Canada or some of those regions that I just mentioned that are cool climate, you'll find that the alcohol level is lower. And when you see that, often the calorie level is lower if it's not um, an off-dry wine, meaning that there's some sugar still left in the wine. Okay, that that certainly yeah. helps. Good. And um, before we go in, <laughs> Nita and I were giggling, thinking, I wonder what her response is going to be to this. Make your own wine. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> response. I have nightmares. Um, <laughs> That's what we figured you'd say. <laughs> I know. But, you know, I've been in situations at dinner parties in the early years before everyone became terrified of bringing me a wine because I wrote about wine. Um, but in the early days when they had didn't have those fears, I, I've been presented with, you know, homemade wines, which were to me like really ugly babies. And you kind of have to just look <laughs> at it and say, well, well, and then you taste it and you go, wow, this is unlike anything I've ever tasted. And they'd be pleased with that. And I hopefully will never. <laughs> yeah. We get that well-watered fern in the oh, corner gosh. with the wine. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, and some people would say, well, what do you do? And I say, well, take an empty pill bottle, fill it with Smarties, and then say, oh, my gosh, I'm really sorry, but this is just going to interfere with my medication. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I remember that one, Anita. <laughs> yeah, tell us well, how you really feel there, Natalie. <laughs> all, all the red ones. <laughs> just save the red Smarties. But, um, but, okay, so seriously, the flip side is that <laughs> so, some people, this is a family tradition, and they do take it seriously. It's all about the ingredients. It's like cooking. Are they getting good ingredients? Are they, you know, some people will drive down to Niagara and get fresh grapes and then take it really seriously step by step. And you know what? It's, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's about as good as you're going to get, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's how how far I'll give on that. But uh, no, I, you know it's fun. Like people who love to make their own bread and artisanal kinds of foods and drinks, and go for it. I just think with these days in the liquor store, there are so many well priced wines that um, unless it's just something you enjoy doing, don't do it to save money and don't bring it to my house. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, now that we know exactly how you feel on that, moving on to Anita. <laughs> <laughs> right. So sort of along those lines, well, these things, you see them popping up everywhere. Now they're wine in cans, and of course there's wine in tetra packs. How do you feel about that? Does it change the taste? Right. So more and more really good wines are being 
packaged, I guess, you can't say bottled, uh, in cans and Tetra packs. And they are convenient. Um, I think they help to take the stuffiness out of wine because you don't need a corkscrew. You know, most beverages do not require a special implement just to get into them. Um, they're great for camping poolside where you're concerned about glass breakage. And really, they have moved away. I mean, certainly there are lots of cheap and nasty stuff still in them. But more and more, uh, better wines are being uh, canned and, and under Tetra Pak. You know, a brand that's here in Ontario is called Big House. It's from California. It's terrific. And um, I also like that with these cans, you, you can get a better idea of serving size because often they'll can it in uh, like what would be the equivalent of one glass of wine. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's also good for moderation. So so that doesn't change the, the taste or anything like that? Yes and no. First of all, if you just want to have a wine and just drink and whatever, and you're not concerned about, you know, the whole sniffing and sipping thing, then it really doesn't matter. But a lot of um, the beauty and pleasure of wine is in the nose, not the actual taste. Mm -hmm. We can detect, they think now, millions of different aromas, five tastes on our tongues, you know, the sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami. Uh, But the, the whole pleasure and complexity, if you want to go there, is in your nose. So, you know, drinking it straight out of the can or Tetra Pak, you're not really <laughs> swirling and you can't really get that sense. You need a glass. So, you could still have glasses, though, with your cans and Tetra Packs, but usually you're getting that format of packaging because you just want convenience, ease, and, and not to get into all of that. So, there's a yes and no. Um, if you're drinking it straight out of those packages, um, you're probably not going to get the aromas as much as you would by pouring it into a good glass. It's supposed to be oh. an experience, isn't it? It's supposed to be the whole thing, exactly. not, just, not just chugging some wine. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> it isn't just about the buzz, although the buzz is part of the package. It be nice, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have sort of this, yeah, I wouldn't call it like a family feud or anything like that, a little bit of a family debate about red wine and whether it should be sipped at room temperature or should it be chilled just a titch. Like I know that, uh, you know, uh, most of the time, um, wine is uh, stored in a wine cellar, so it's a little bit cooler there. So would you recommend room temperature, little titch cooler? What, what's your take? So the advice about serving red wine at room temperature dates back to medieval times and medieval castles when they didn't have central heating and the temperature would have been, I don't know, 17, 18 degrees, probably chillier. Mm. Um, so that's what they meant by room temperature, Today, um, well, we're kind of moving out of summer now, but, you know, especially if you're serving red wines in summer heat or in centrally heated homes, it's it's often too warm. And what happens when red wine is too warm or any wine, what you're going to get first is the alcohol and the tannin and sort of the heaviness of the wine. It's not going to be refreshing. Um, it's not going to be sort of... Uh, zesty with you, you know your aromas of bright berries and all the rest of it. So I do recommend cooling it, just to use your term there, I need it, a titch. Um, so I don't know if that, which side of the family debate you were on. But That's what I, I was going to say. Who won that, Anita? <laughs> yeah. You know what? It actually wasn't me, so I'm going to, I'm not even going to mention. <laughs> you'll, just, you go. you'll just deliver Natalie's I answer. I got caught in the crossfire. No. <laughs> Very good. But I, I, sometimes I'll go out to restaurants, and if the red wine has been sitting somewhere warm, I'll ask for an ice bucket, and they'll think I'm from another planet, but I just want to bring the temperature down just a little because, again, when it's warm or hot, even worse, all you get is this sort of, uh, I don't know, heavy, heavy alcohol, tannin and oak. That's what's in the front of the wine. That's interesting. You know, I was watching um, Ellen years ago and Diane Keaton came out and she was talking about how she liked chilled red wine and Ellen Mm -hmm. was making this big deal about saying, oh, you know, no one likes that and why'd you drink that? And they brought out chilled red wine for her and I thought maybe that is how you're supposed to drink it. Maybe everybody else is wrong. So thank you for that answer. Absolutely. This is your license to chill. This is right. (laughs) This is right. And we can find uh, all these hints and stuff. You, You teach wine courses. You teach all about this. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Sure. Um, Well, I come from a long line of teachers in Nova Scotia. Uh, My grandmother was an English teacher. My mom taught 
grade two for 32 years. Mm-hmm. I taught dance school, Highland Dancing, oh, for a year. Oh, wow. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. My maritime roots. So <laughs> teaching's in the blood. I love teaching. And... Um, so I come full circle now after having written about wine for more than 20 years and done all sorts of other things, mobile apps and so on. Now, um, I think the opportunity to teach online is wonderful. And people think, well, how does that work? Are you going to text me the wine? Or right. <laughs> I mean, wine is such a sensory subject. But I think online wine and food pairing classes, like the ones that I offer, have so many advantages over in-person classes, especially now um, with the, the quarantine and all the rest of it. But even apart from that, I think there are lots of advantages. So, for instance, I have a lot of couples who take my classes, and it's kind of a two-for-one because it's sort of one course fee, but the two of them take it together, and ah. they treat it like date night. That's and a great so, idea. Yeah, exactly. So they'll sit down and watch some of the videos or because it's a mix of pre-recorded videos but also live tastings online and people can go at their own pace. They don't have to hire a babysitter, put the kids to bed, no uh, drinking and driving, no finding parking, all that sort of thing. And then for other people in smaller communities, there may not be wine classes offered there that they want to take. So, yeah, people in smaller communities find it's very convenient. Um, Because uh, a lot of the material is pre-recorded, they can go at their own pace. They get lifetime access. It's not like an in-person course where it's one and done and then you don't have any access to your instructor afterwards. I'm there forever um, because we keep going with the tastings. They get lifetime access to that too. And then those with mobility issues, all kinds of things. I think they come to these classes and... It, it, they're not as nervous as sitting in a class. They're not as nervous asking questions. You know, wine has a lot of social hang-ups, but I think the online aspect can really remove a lot of that for people. I I couldn't agree more with that. I, I went to a workshop of wine and I asked a question and, and I was shot down like I am complete dum-dum and I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, I, I shouldn't be here. I'm, I'm sure it was done without intention. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Um, really, you've been wine shamed and, and that should never sh- happened to anyone, <laughs> anyone. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> my, so my classes are kind of a healing therapy for that. There you okay, go. Well, there you go. <laughs> you're my next, you're my next workshop, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and what people do with my classes is that, you know, at first they'll just lurk, like they'll be on the table things, but maybe their camera's turned off. No one has to be on camera, by the way. So they just watch. But gradually, I notice as the course goes on, they, you know, more and more people turn on their cameras, and then they start asking questions, and then they, I can't shut them up, right. um, you know, because the, the conversation continues. It's so much fun. And then there's a private Facebook group, and they're always sharing recipes, and I just tried this wine, and, and then some of them are starting to meet up in real life, and they've developed friends which is kind of fun. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's well, really great. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, with the the online teachings are food and wine pairings, can you give us, you know, one of your best tips for pairing wine and food? Sure can. Um, so think about this. If you would normally slather butter on your dish or if you would squeeze lemon on your dish, those two things are going to determine what type of wine you can choose. So if you're slathering butter on your dish, go with something more full-bodied and luscious, maybe an oak chardonnay or even a full-bodied red. But if you're doing a squeeze of lemon, possibly on a fish dish or something like that, you want something zesty and bright like a like one of those Rieslings we talked about or a, a Pinot Noir. It kind of can gauge or guide you in the style and weight of the wine that you would choose with the dish. Oh, that's so good. And that's probably mm. why I like a Chardonnay goes so well with cheese because it's like that buttery, creamy, rich yes. type of thing. Okay. Exactly. I exactly. Love, that's a great hint. That's a great tip. Oh, good. White wine you know, is obviously best chilled, but sometimes, you know, you're traveling in a car or what have you, it's summertime, and, you know, when you get to your destination, it's no longer cold. What do you recommend for chilling a hot bottle of white wine? Mm, Okay, well, I call it the wet t-shirt trick, and it's not what you think. (laughs) (laughs) 
you want to uh, dip a T-shirt or a towel, I'm thinking of the cottage, but again, as we move to cooler weather, uh, just take a wet towel that's already got cold water on it, wrap around the bottle, and then put the bottle in the freezer, and do not forget it, so set a timer or something, and take it out in 15 minutes. If it's sticking to the bottle, you can run it briefly under warmer water. It's not going to warm the wine back up. But the reason it works is that there's a full sort of dispersion of that coldness around the bottle uh, that will really bring it down uh, in temperature twice as fast as if you had put the bottle into the freezer. This is also the reason why chilling a bottle in ice water works faster than ice. So in ice, there's pockets of air, unmelted ice, but ice water, you've got a full dispersion of cold water covering the entire bottle. So it comes down more quickly in temperature. Great idea. Yeah, because I I don't like drinking. I don't know about you, Anita, but I I don't like drinking anything other than ice cold white wine. So that's a great trick. Gee, you you really know what you're talking about, don't you? (laughs) (laughs) Been around the block. It's well for the (laughs) olives. Well, we wanted to also ask, since we are moms sipping sangria and sangria is made with uh, wine. Can you give suggestions for, you know, best reasonably priced red and a white for a sangria? Sure. So sangria has its roots in Spain, as you know, and great with tapas. Uh, so I, for red, I go with a value priced Spanish red wine made from Garnacha, which is the grape or Grenache. There's uh, one in the LCBO now called uh, Monasterio, and it's about 14 bucks. and I'll post that on my website. Um, so you're looking for, the, the reason why it works too is not just the sort of cultural heritage, is that it's a smooth red wine, it, which is what you want when you're choosing a wine for sangria because, uh, again, the tannins, you don't want those furry mouth tannins in your sangria, Mm -hmm. Um, when they're served cold, they get really chalky, very furry mouthed, and that's not a great thing in your sangria. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd recommend on the red side. And then on the white, probably, you know, one of those Rieslings, a zesty white wine. Again, you don't want a heavily oaked Chardonnay in your sangria, and it's easy to keep that under 20 bucks. Try Henry of Pelham Riesling from Niagara. I've had that, actually. That's really nice. Okay. Very good. good. Excellent. What about rosé? Uh, what's the best way to drink that? Quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was your answer. and Now I understand that's actually your answer. <laughs> yes. She said pausing. No, I love rosé. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, themes or memes online now, rosé all day. Um, but it's such a wonderful wine. It's my second favorite after Pinot Noir because you get that sort of cherry berry, lovely flavor of red, but again, without the heavy oak alcohol and so on. So with rosé, I do like it chilled for sure. Um, and I'll even put ice cubes in it. So there's sacrilege um, <laughs> from your wine shamers. Let's go tell them that. The, the wine gods are about to strike you down, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I better keep moving. Um, but uh, yeah, no, and rosé is wonderful right in through, like, don't think about it like wearing white. I can't do it past Labor Day. It's perfect with Thanksgiving or holiday turkey, anything that, you know, is a drier meat. Um, it, it just has such a wide range of pairing possibilities, Plus, it's wonderful on its own. Nice. And uh, before we wrap up, I know we've we've taken so much of your time. You've been so generous. Uh, anything else that we should be keeping in mind? Uh, wine hacks from the world of wine. What is your last few words here? Um, when it comes to wine and food pairing, don't get too uptight about choosing the one perfect pairing or one perfect wine. It, it is about pairing the wine to the diner, not the dinner. So drink what you like. When I teach my students the online wine and food pairing classes, and we dive into everything from takeout to veggies to different types of cheeses, it's all over the place, and we have a lot of fun, but it always comes back to drink what you like, please your own palate, become an expert on your own palate, your own, be your own personal sommelier, because I do think that is kind of a, a recipe for happiness. Sure, that makes sense. And you've got a free gift for our listeners. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, where they can get it. I do. So for your listeners, I've created the Ultimate Food and Wine Pairing Guide. It's a, it's a wonderful template 
chart that they can print out if they like and keep in the kitchen or refer to it online. But it's got all the major types of wine, red, white, sparkling, rosé, and different types within those categories. And which dishes pair best with those wines. So it's an easy reference if you're kind of looking for ideas. You know what you're having for dinner, but which wine. And your listeners can get it for free at nataliemcclain.com forward slash moms. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you have your own URL now. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, So nataliemcclain.com forward slash mom. You know, my my name isn't the easiest, but it's N-A-T-A-L-I-E-M-A. A C L E A N Natalie McLean dot com forward slash moms. That's amazing, yeah. and and we'll put that up on uh, our website. And of course, you have a website where we can listen to your podcast because you're a podcaster, a writer. You've got additional fabulous uh, tools and tips, and so that's also Natalie McLean uh, dot com. Yes, it is. It's the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast, and it's I interview like celebrities from the wine world, chefs, winemakers, really crazy obsessive winemakers and uh, other personalities in the wine world because it's all about telling stories, but in between you learn a lot about wine too. Thank you so much for your time today, Natalie. And, you uh, you know, we'll be thinking of you and cheersing you when we uh, have our next glass. So (laughs) stay safe and well. Oh, I raise my glass to both of you. Anita, Sheila, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Natalie. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Cheers. So can I just say, I love Natalie McLean. And, uh, you know, it was so weird, Anita, we were talking to her, as you know, off, off mic a little bit. And she's from the same hometown as my husband in Nova Scotia, which reinforces it's a very, very small world. Like, what are the odds? Small world, small world. It was just crazy. I was floored to hear that they were both from the same town. That's really cool. Yeah, and I did ask if he knew her, and and he said uh, no. But you know, so I mean, anything is small, but it's not that small. Where you're gonna like, yeah, Jen, she was right. related to this. Um, so Anita, you know, unless you're living in PEI. <laughs> That's according to your husband, right? That's so funny. Um, And, you know, after we finished the interview, one of the things that we didn't get to, but I thought, oh, my God, I have to ask her this. When she was saying about the cans of wine and how that kind of keeps uh, the measurement proper and it's equivalent to one glass of wine, I'm like, Natalie, what exactly is one glass of wine? Because it's really interpretive depending where you go. And she said it's a five ounce glass of wine. So in one bottle of wine, you should get five five ounce glasses, not two right. glasses in one bottle like I do, <laughs> but, <laughs> but five glasses. So now we know. There you go. It was a little disheartening to hear how little is considered a glass of wine. I, I'll tell you, I, sure. went, I went upstairs and I got a measuring cup and I got my, my glass <laughs> and I poured five ounces in and I'm like, oh, wow, I've been really overdoing it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Ah, uh, heck, that's okay. That saves you having to go back and refill it again. <laughs> that's what I say. You know, it's just, it's saving, it's saving yeah. energy. Uh, so it is time to raise that five ounce glass or take a pass. And this is where we, <laughs> this is where we cheer someone or something great, or we, you know, toss a sangria over their head. Are you raising a glass or taking a pass this time, Anita? I'm actually going to raise a glass and I'm going to raise a glass to all the teachers who are working their magic in classrooms and online. But I'm also going to raise a glass to one teacher in particular. Now, she has retired. Her name is Miss Kalmick, and she taught all of my children uh, when they were in grade one. So this goes back a long time. She dealt with so many shenanigans that they were, you know, during that stage of, of their little lives. But one in particular really stuck out because right now Ava and I are going out and we're picking up little acorns and things and bringing them home and putting them around the house and stuff just as decorations. And what we also used to do with the kids when they were little was we used to pick up um, pine cones. And so... One day after recess, Campbell had been outside and he had picked up a pine cone and he thought, I'm going to give it as a gift to Miss Kalmick. So he brought it into the classroom and he said, I have a present for you. And she opened her hand and he put the pine cone into her hand. She took a look at it and it was actually a frozen piece of dog poop. No! (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God! That's horrifying! (laughs) That is just one of the 
stories that this poor woman put up with with my children. So, oh. Miss Kalmick, I raise a glass to you. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like one of the best stories ever. That would be horrifying and charming at the same time, right? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No oh kidding. Oh, my goodness. She laughed. She is a really good sport. What about you, Sheila? Well, I am totally toasting an early mentor a friend of mine. Her name is Donna Tranquata, and she is a wonderful, award-winning journalist. I worked with her for years and years in Toronto, and she just took first place fiction short story in the Prairie Fire magazine, which is one of Canada's oldest literary magazines. I'll tell you, you'd never know she's a journalist because she's not bitter or jaded. She's so sweet, <laughs> and she's so oh. light, and she's just so funny. Funny. And uh, reading her short story, man, she's got a dark side. <laughs> Does she now? Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Kudos to her. My yeah. goodness. And this is someone who not only can she, you know, uh, she's a broadcast journalist. She's written for a lot of, you know, different Canadian magazines. She's a beautiful painter. And now she's published too. So that that is who I am raising a glass to. You know that person early in your career, and you probably have one too, who you looked at, you thought, you know, I, I want to be like them when I grow up. And I remember her being really balanced mm-hmm. with, with family, with work. And, and I just thought, you know, this, um, I think I can do this. So just like our friend Aaron Davis, you know, Donna kind of reinforced that to me saying, you know, there are women all over the place who can be successful with, you know, careers and be moms and, and you know, at least try to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So kudos to Donna. Mm-hmm. And that is who I am toasting. I am also <laughs> Uh, tossing. I don't know about you. When you're going to the grocery stores, this is where I'm seeing the, the COVID idiots. And a lot of people are doing their parts, but the ones who aren't are just ruining it for everybody. And I have caught two people now in the grocery store whose phones have, you know, rang, rung, what's the pr- ring? And they pull down their mask to talk on the phone. And I'm thinking, dude, they can hear you through your mask. Why are you pulling your, your right. mask down? You know, I mean, I don't know what we have to do to um, make everybody really take this seriously. But I guess I, I guess you're either on board or you're not or you're not thinking or whatever. But, um, you know, I just I'm tossing sangrias over those people. Well, and I'm, I'm totally with you on that, Sheila. And I think I know people are getting tired of it, but we're not done. And so we do have to keep it up and keep going. We're going to have higher numbers than we were you know, when everything shut down in March and that's coming very quickly. So we do need to do our part, everybody. Um, So I'm with you on that and taking a pass to the COVID idiots that are out there. For sure, for sure. So in addition to these things or people that we've toasted or tossed, we have a few favorite things on our website, which we raise a glass to each episode. We would love to share those with you. You can find them on our Fave Finds page of our website, momssippingsangria.com. Sheila? Yeah, mine this week is a wonderful Bluetooth keyboard where you can put a tablet, you can put a, you know, an iPad, um, whatever you want, a, a phone, Android, iPhone, and you, you put it in the slot and all of a sudden you have a keyboard. Because I am a horrible typer with my thumbs. I, I The things that I have sent out <laughs> accidentally... Because my thumbs have a mind of their own. I don't know. I feel more productive if I have a keyboard. So this oh, thing. Oh, absolutely. Is, I mean, you could probably go faster with it. Oh, so a hundred yeah, times. I, I'm, cool. a, I'm an old school typer. I use my kids like, oh my God, mom, you're using all four fingers on both hands. I'm like, no kidding. That That's how we used to do it. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that's where what I'm uh, favoring this week. And it's going to be on the website. What about you, my dear? Okay. So, well, I have this hair dryer, but also volumizer at the same time. And it's really cool. I got it last year for Christmas from Ian. So uh, I don't know how he knew that I need this. I didn't know I needed it, but uh, it is, um, it's, it just, it cuts your time so much. It blow dries and it gives you that lift at the same time. And it's all in one. So you don't have to be holding a brush. You don't have to put things down and pick things up. It's awesome. I absolutely love it. So I'm going to be that as my fave find this time. You have piqued my interest. I might have to get myself one of those. And I'm guaranteeing you that, uh, you know, I love Ian and he's smart and he's got all sorts of great ideas. But that was some some woman in the office said, you know what Anita needs? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you read about it. Probably. <laughs> Any, anytime Greg gets me one of those girly things, I'm like, somebody somewhere yeah. told you about this, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, cheers to all those people, places, and things. We raise a glass uh, to you as well. Cheers. Cheers. 
We've come to the part of the show which we call the Sangria Chronicles, featuring good news stories only, because who wants to sip and cry? Not I. There's enough uh, <laughs> There's enough of that going around in the world already. Let's put on... <laughs> Let's put on those rosé colored glasses. Get get that one. Smart. <laughs> Focus on the good news only. All right. <laughs> all right. So I've got a story from our um, neighbors south of the border. And it's a good news one, not a gong show. No. So. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, There is a new survey conducted by the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation in the United States. They surveyed 2,000 Americans and they have found that more than half of the 2,000 folks surveyed are appreciating nature more than they did before COVID. And you and I have talked about this. Mm, We have. Yeah. So six in 10 said they have been able to finally take the time to explore their local communities with local parks trails and lakes topping the list of the newfound areas and um, as a result this you know blast of nature has had a positive effect on their mood and one in four have noticed it's been great for their physique as well so yeah there's a lot of bad stuff tied to covid no doubt but if you can see some of the glass half full. This is one of them because you and I have talked, we've, we've become bird ladies. Mm-hmm. We've gone on all sorts of walks. <laughs> I, You know, like I'm seeing things I've never seen before around my neighborhood and I've gone for walks like I don't even know how many times, but I'm always walking with a mission. Now I'm just walking leisurely right. and seeing things like, oh, that's a nice house. I didn't notice that house before or whatever, right? So it's nice. Right. And actually appreciating it, appreciating taking that walk instead of saying I have to get this over with. Exactly. I think that's good. And, and uh, that story is from a wonderful source of information, good news information that I have followed for years. It's called the Good News uh, Now Network, and um, we're going to be mm. we're going to be sharing good news stories uh, every episode because we think the world needs a little bit better news and not just all the bad stuff, right? So, if you have a good news story to share, or you would like to cheer someone you know who did something that made you or others happy, we would love to hear it. You can send it in via our website, MomsSippingSangria.com. Let's spill the sangria. Any juicy or funny stories that you want to spill over a sangria, Miss Anita? Why, yes, I do, Miss Sheila. (laughs) For such respect. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All righty then. I shall get started. It's about someone that I call Mr. Magoo. And, uh, you know, and with all, you know, fondness in my heart, uh, he was Ava's piano teacher when she was, you know, much younger. And uh, he was this old man and he had a cane, but boy, could he ever play the piano? Fantastic. Uh, But he was old and like the kids were kind of worried, like, is he going to keel over in our house? So, but I have a soft spot for old men and Ian knows this. So he's always like, Ooh, I'm a year older. Yes, I'm getting there. So (laughs) I like, for instance, I love Jimmy Stewart. That was my first love when I was like a teenager. I thought he was just the sweetest little old man. So, yes. so Mr. Magoo, I am also known. Uh, I have these what I call Claire Dunphy moments. And that's, you know, Claire Dunphy from Modern Family. Yes. So, I, uh, you know, and the kids were always like, oh, my God, she just pulled another Claire Dunphy. So... Here we go with my, my little, my clear Dunphy. So, of course, you know, when you got three young kids, you're always running around. And Mr. Magoo is very slow. So, so I had to leave and he hadn't quite arrived yet, but Ian was in the house. So I'm like, you know what? I got to go somewhere. You greet him at the door and bring him in for Ava. He was like, yeah, no problem. I get into the driveway and I um, get into my car. I'm just pulling out of the driveway and I see Mr. Magoo pulling into the driveway. So I'm like, ah, he saw me. I can't go. So I stop my car. I'm sitting in the car idling, waiting for him to get out of the car. And, you know, very slowly, Mr. Magoo gets out of the car and he's got his cane and he turns and he looks at me and I wave. And then just before I leave, I blow him a big kiss. And why I blew him a big kiss? I have no idea. He already had big eyes. I thought they were going to fall out of his head. (laughs) 
this poor guy. He almost dropped his cane. I'm like, ah, yeah. And then I just took, I was like, I can't even explain it. I don't know why. So poor Mr. Magoo. I'm crushing on <laughs> you, Mr. Magoo. St- <laughs> I know. That's so funny. I'm like, why did I do that? As I was like in mid motion, I'm like, what are you doing? But it was too late. It's too late. You've already made the commitment to the hand movement. You know, when somebody lets you in, I, you know, you do a wave. I've actually blown kisses yeah. by accident too. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? It's a reaction. Maybe, maybe, you know, there's a part of us, Anita, that, that knows these people actually need a bit more than a wave. <laughs> I think so. Oh Poor my Mr. Gosh. Magoo. He was so cute. Okay, well, thank you for letting us hang out with you, and we hope you're staying well and healthy. Remember, past episodes, fave finds, sangria recipes, and other great stuff can be found on our website, momssippingsangria.com. So before we sign off, we will leave you with a new segment, and this is actually sort of like a little bit of a reflection and introspection, um, leaving it a bit on a high note. Hmm. So, um, Sheila, I'm going to ask you this question, and then we're going to leave it with our listeners as well. Okay. What was your last moment of pride? It's going to be about uh, the kids for sure, because I'm so darn proud of uh, my kids. So this involves uh, my daughter, Lila, who's our middle child. We were driving a friend of hers home late one night, and we came across an accident that literally just happened. So I'm the kind that like jumps out Ooh. of the car and, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong? And, and I'm usually the person who leads what should we do out of my family? Well, didn't Lila basically push me out of the way, go to the woman, like she was in action and I'd never seen that before. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like it was just, it was amazing how these instincts just kicked in. And she's talked about working in social services. She's talked about, you know, a firefighter, a nurse, whatever. I think that's the world she has to be in because I was so proud of her that night thinking I literally didn't even have to be there. Like she took control. She calmed this woman down. She told me what to do. And I'm like, excuse me, are you my daughter? Like, aren't I supposed to be the boss here? And um, yeah, so I would have to say that was my last moment of pride. Oh, well, now I'm proud of Lila, too. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she's uh, That's she's a really very, great. She's a very capable kid. So um, thank you for asking mm-hmm. that one. So for everyone listening, we're going to put that question out to you as well. What was your last moment of pride? Yeah, I wonder what uh, what answers are percolating okay. in the heads. Um, so mm-hmm. all right, that's it for now. Until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are Moms Sipping Sangria. Don't move your head. Don't move your head. You got a good Scottish accent going on there. That must be living with that that sassy man you live with. Yeah. I'm ready for for down on the couch now. <laughs> so can't this day be over? Mom sipping sangria is produced by Elm Podcasting. Cha cha cha. Woohoo! Hello.